Thank you. <laughs> Thank Just you. starting with basically setting the scene. Uh, so the global road freight mobility market is a four trillion dollar market. It's do dominated by the large truck manufacturers and global uh, freight service providers, and it actually accounts for 10% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And looking back at 2016, and we'll come back to what, what else happened back then, but at that point, like, a lot of change was already happening in the passenger car space. Mm. We've already seen uh, a lot of movement in terms of both electrification and automation. But uh, you saw something, Linnea, you and your co-founders, that that change wasn't happening in the track industry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think when you start out as an entrepreneur, you need to choose what you're going to go after. And both myself and my co-founders, I think that we are very much entrepreneurs at heart. And so we, we started out, we were looking for a problem that was big and that we wanted to put a really big ambition to solve. And it turns out that, like you just said, that the freight industry hasn't really changed in mm. about 100 years. Mm. And it's one of the biggest contributor to, to uh, um, CO2 emissions. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, someone had to do something, and I think that we find a good way of, of yeah. tackling it. So that was actually quite a big challenge to take on, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, can you describe like, the moment when you and your co-founders decided to like, really do this, this very bold move and uh, challenge this whole industry? <laughs> it's actually quite a <laughs> funny story. So Robert, uh, founder and CEO of the company, he's been working in the traditional industry and he had this idea of that you should be able to do transportation sustainable. It's not the technology that is not in place. It's actually the system itself that's preventing it from moving forward. Mm. And so he was just like talking about this every day for like six months. And I felt, you know, okay, so either you, you know, you need to shut up about this now because <laughs> I can't take it anymore or we need to do something about it. And so that is really like the defining moment. And we really, you know, remember that moment when we decided, okay, let's do it. Let's okay. jump. Very cool. And what, what do you think was actually stopping the industry from transforming already before you guys started? Uh, like what, was there, what were the obstacles that you needed to kind of overcome? Oh, there's been a lot. <laughs> we can spend hours talking yeah. about that. I think the current industry, uh, it, it's hard for the current industry to transform to electric because electric is so fundamentally different from diesel. Mm. And so if you want to make electric efficient and you want to, to have a, a good business model, you need to rethink the whole mythology. Mm. And that's where we come in, because we're looking at it from a technology perspective, and we're looking from a volumes being moved, and that's also why we, we like to call what we're doing freight mobility, because it's so much about how you can make sure that moves good, that you move goods in the most yeah, efficient and the, the smartest way. Mm. Mm. And this has been quite a, a journey, right, in many ways. But like, if we start with the product, because when we first met, I think it's now five or even six years ago, <laughs> like my first impression was like, this is this super cool company building a very futuristic, autonomous electric pod. Um, and like, if I look at the product now, it's at, as much a software company as a hardware company. As li yeah. At least that's how I see it. Like, would you agree to that? Absolutely. I would say that we're technology first. And for, we, would, we have always considered ourselves being a software technology mm. uh, company. But when we started out, it was very hard to explain that we're building an operating system for electric and electric autonomous freight. Mm. And when we were out pitching that to customers, they were like, what? What is that? Mm. What is autonomous? <laughs> and I mean, also going back to uh, 2016, the industry didn't believe in electric trucks. Mm. And I think that is so important to keep in mind when we started out. Actually, the, the common understanding was that electric trucks will never work because the batteries are too heavy. Mm. You cannot do a good business case. Mm. And I mean, that has really changed now. And mm. I think now all the big industry players are having some sort of ambition of going electric in the next couple of years. Mm. And, it's been really cool to be part of that journey and to see mm. that, that changing. Yeah. 
so much. Maybe just to give a little bit more flavor to the audience, you could like describe a little bit how you're working with your customers today in terms of the different like parts that you guide them through and like to, to actually take them to the end game of being electric and where suitable like use autonomous trucks. Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest difference is if you want to go electric, you also need to go digital. Mm. Uh, because there's no way that you can actually manage how you're going to run an electric fleet if you don't have a digital interface to it. Mm. And so what we're helping the customers is to, first of all, look into how you can go digital and then take the next step to electric and then electric autonomous. Mm. And so what we always start, and I think this is a good maybe to visualize a bit how we're working, is that we start looking into the data. Mm. So coming from a technology perspective, looking into the capacity, looking into where are the customers, the shippers, mm. uh, moving their goods today. Mm. And then we run that through our digital um, platform, where we look into where would it be suitable to go electric today with current infrastructure, but also, of course, where could you actually build out the infrastructure to go electric and electrify even more um, capacity. Mm. And the good thing by going electric is that it's very similar to going autonomous, because you need to look into those very repetitive flows. You need to look into having a much more systematic approach to it. And so what we understood quite early on was that autonomous and electric goes so well, hand mm. in hand. Mm. And that's also how you can really get a great business case mm. by going sustainable. Oh, cool. And so I guess you've kind of educated both your customers and like the whole industry in terms of how this could look like. And <laughs> yeah. maybe if you would like to share also your vision, like, so how would this look like at scale? So we're thinking about it from a grid perspective. Mm. And we're building grids in different regions that has a bit of different purpose. And I mean, what we would love to see in the future is, of course, that all of these grids ultimately connect mm. to each other in one way or another. And I mean, as you started out saying, this is a $4 trillion market. So it's huge. Mm. And today, 99% of all transport, or even more, 99.9, mm. is based on a diesel platform. Mm. And so it's a huge task. Mm. We have a really big ambition. Mm. And we want to be part in really making sure that this happens, because this, it needs to happen. Mm. And there's so many obstacles in this, in this industry is that mm. something needs to change. Mm. And the, like when you describe it, like it's quite a big challenge, as you say, that you've taken on to kind of really transform this four trillion dollar market with big players in there. Mm -hmm. Like, what, could you maybe share a little bit about the founder's story around this? Like, what has it been like to navigate these kind of these different steps that they've been through so far, and like where you're heading? I mean. You can't prepare for it, right? Mm. You just need to, you know, get your head down. You need to focus on what are, what's your next big milestone. And, you know, you can give so many advice how to do it, but, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's going to be, it's going to have its own life. Mm. And you just kind of just need to enjoy and be part of that ride. And I think that if there's something that I often say to, to aspiring entrepreneurs or in early phases is that, don't try to control everything. Like mm. you're part of a journey and you need to accept that it, it's part of it. Mm. Like you need to accept that, you know, focus on what it's you're going to deliver, focus on your customers, make sure that you have a great business, a great team, uh, but everything else, just like enjoy the ride. Mm. Really? Yeah. And another thing I was thinking about, like transforming an industry again, like it's a big, big task and you probably don't want to redo it again in like 10 years uh, when <laughs> everyone has kind of <laughs> kept up <laughs> with you. Uh, but like, how do you build for the long term success, like so that you now create this um, transportation as, as we want to see it also for, from the sustainability perspective? Mm. I think that it's, it's very interesting times right now. And we've been hearing about that, I think, all of these days when, when we've been here, that we are we're in a very turbulent market. And, but what I, what I do think is very interesting to know and to understand is that we're looking at a new industrial revolution in mm. one sense. So we need to start building for a new infrastructure. And so a lot of the companies that came out for the last 10 to 20 years has actually been built on the previous infrastructure. Mm. And so now we're going to see a new infrastructure coming in place. And I truly believe it's going to be very much based on electric. And there's going to be huge opportunities in that market. Mm. And I think that that's also, 
I mean, when we talk about resiliency and we talk about sustainability, we can always just use the technologies that we believe is the best right now. Not all technologies, you know, it's always, you know, pros and cons with different technologies, but we always have to strive for, to find the best way moving forward. Mm. And right now, I would say that electric is one of them, that we, we know that it's better than diesel. We, we know that it's, 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 we know that it's working. Mm. And so therefore we need to, start adapting to that new yeah. infrastructure as well. Yeah, and, and speaking about this next generation of next generation industry, basically, and I think in my opinion, and also for full disclosure, we are invested in Enride. <laughs> um, I think Enride is a perfect ex example of what we define as an impact unicorn. So a company that not only has the potential to reach a valuation about $1 billion, but also can positively impact the lives of one, more than 1 billion people. And like, we really think that now is the time to, to show that there's a correlation rather than a contradiction between impact and financial returns. Yeah. Could you, like, when you speak to your customers, like, what's typically the rationale for, for them like, going along for the N-Ride ride? And like, how do they look at the, the link between these two aspects? Oh, it's, uh, I, we have so many beautiful stories mm -hmm. about that. Uh, we had, you know, customers or shippers coming up and saying, we want to work with you because our kids love what you're doing. And they can really see that you're doing something that's meaningful and that will have an impact for their generation. Mm. Or just also people that just say, you know, I want, to, I want to create a better future for my kids. I want to be part of this and try to do my part in making sure that we, that we fight mm. yeah, the, the, the uh, climate crisis. And um, so I, there's so many of that uh, that really also motivates myself and, and the team and to really feel like we can do a difference. We just need to do it together. Mm. And uh, I must say, we're very grateful for Norgren. And that was also our first office in, in Stockholm. So it's, uh, it's, awesome. we've been together for quite some yeah, time now. Yeah, we have. We have, actually. <laughs> and speaking about impact and maybe also uh, culture, because you said like you're, you're on a long-term journey and you're now a big team. And have you seen that the, the impact mission has kind of affected your company culture and like how you work together? Absolutely. So if there was one thing that, uh, that Robert said in the beginning was that the best engineers in the world wants to solve the hardest problems. Mm. And so here we are. We're having one of the biggest challenges of our lifetime, mm. talking about climate crisis and, and everything going on, and right now, with, you know, even more. And I think something that became very obvious during pandemic is how fragile the logistics system is, and that mm. we need to build resiliency to be able to serve society. And so we have, we have it from a, from a climate perspective, we have it from a social perspective, and it's a really big engineering task to solve. Mm. And I think that has been, We've been very fortunate in that sense that we've been able to recruit, I would say, some of the best people in the world to be able to solve and to work to solve this problem. It's, mm. it's not an easy task. Mm. I mean, it's super hard. And I mean, we're very humble that this is a, you know, it's going to impact a lot of people's lives. Mm. So we need to do this right and we need to do the best that we can. Mm. But also being humble, you know, about that it's tough, but also have the confidence to say, you know, if anyone is going to solve it, it's going to be us. Mm. Mm. And together, of course, with partners and with customers to make sure that we, that we reach this ultimate goal. Mm. Yeah. I guess like the, the impact that Enride uh, has is not only kind of what you yourselves are doing. And, and just to give an example, like so Enride, like coming out of Nordics, you started five, six years ago. You were, you were actually the first company uh, to get a permit to drive autonomous tracks on, on US roads. Yeah. Like, how has the rest of the industry reacted? And like, have you seen that they've kind of accelerated their, their kind of way of working? Or what's, the, what's been the effect outside of, of Enride? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, how, how do we answer this question? I think that a lot of people were a bit surprised that this small Swedish company were the first to get the permit in the US to drive on public road. And I think that annoyed a lot of people, uh, and maybe a lot of investors as well. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, I think what that really goes to show is that our way of thinking about it, and it really breaks down to methodology in how you're implementing this technology, that it's working. And we have said since day one that if you want to go sustainable, you need to have a sustainable business case. Mm. 
mm. and to have a sustainable business case, you need to have customers that want to buy what you're selling, right? Mm. And if you want to go autonomous, we, so that's why we started out with a pod, that we didn't have a safety driver since day one, because we know as long as you have a safety driver in the vehicle, it's not going to make business sense. Mm. So you need to remove the, uh, the truck driver from the equation if you want to make autonomous cheaper than today's solution. Mm. And then, of course, we have the monitoring and we have a driver that can work remotely, but that can monitor multiple vehicles. Mm. And so I think it's interesting. I think there's a lot of people now looking our direction and looking into that this could be a way of solving uh, mm. for the next. So is it too, too soon to say that kind of you will be doing to the truck market what Tesla did to the passenger market? I think we're getting there. I think that there is... Um, there is yeah, I think we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to be out, out there in the, in the audience. And we were speaking backstage about kind of, we've, and you said before now that you don't want to give advice, but still maybe you can share some of your, your wisdom. <laughs> and maybe if we start with kind of where to, where, where to start, like how do you define if you want to start a company and therefore probably address like a challenge of some sort of kind because that's mm. I guess what entrepreneurship is about, like yeah. where, where would you uh, guide people to, to start? I would start, I think this is very typical, with, but start with the customer. Start looking into, is this something that people actually want? Is there any traction for it? And a great way of doing that is to work with design and to work with design principles and to visualize that this is something how the future might look like and if this would be possible. And that's actually what we did with the pod. Mm. So we went out to customers and we said, we're building this software, we're building this operating system that's going to lay the foundation to go sustainable. Would you like to be part of it? Mm. And you know, people couldn't realize what it was because it was so abstract in mm. that sense. And so then we created a pod, which mm. was a great visualization of that this is how the future will look like. Mm. Or at least this is how the future might look it might look like, and would you like to be part of it? Mm. And then we got plenty of customers, but everyone wanted to, to buy the pod. Mm. So that was the, <laughs> the second challenge for us. We were like, no, you don't buy the pod, you actually buy you know, the, the transportation mm. or the capacity, you know, moving mm. goods from A to B. But I think a lot of people really, you know, really loved the idea of what the pod represented. And mm. I mean, still to today, I think that's for us as well, it's one of us most Share is then most valuable, I, I think, almost like a mascot for us. Mm, yeah. So first, start with a problem, like find a way to maybe visualize the solution, in your yeah. case, the pod. And start selling. Start selling. Okay, like so how early did you start selling? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't need to be like, you know, but at least get like an LOI mm. that if we're able to... Um, if we're able to produce this, would you buy it? And can we get that like in writing? And to find those people that really want you know, the, the buy into your company, into your idea. Mm. And in terms of building the team, um, like what, would you, what did you think about when you put together your first team? And I think it's been different stages in, in the company for us. I think that ultimately what's been really for me is to be very clear about expectations. And to be really, I think something that we talk a lot about is that we want to be one of the best companies in the world. Mm. And we're very open about that. We're like, you know, we want to play in the pre Premier League. We want to play in the NFA, uh, mm. NFL. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> the sports <laughs> analogies. Uh, but we, we really want to be one of the best. And if you want to be one of the best, you need to be very open to your team and to say that, that it's okay if you don't want to put in those hours, mm. but then probably you should not work at Enride. Mm. Because we're in here together because we really, truly believe that we have a shot on making this happen. Mm. And we want people that are in that timing of their life that they actually want to be part of that. Mm. And I think that's the, um, that's the beauty of being very open about expectations and to also say, like, you know, this is a journey. Mm. This is the ride that we're doing together and this is what you can expect from everyone in the team. Mm. Mm. So it's not only expected of you, but you can also expect that from everyone here. Mm. And of course, you need to have a lot of kindness and you need to have working with a lot with inclusion and to make people feel very welcome. But to, you know, we're, we are very ambitious. We have a really ambitious goal. We're not that big of a team, but we have, you know, we're challenging some of the biggest infrastructures there, mm. there is. Yeah, yeah. I think anyone who has seen kind of your, your pod or your 
kind of your, your work around that has probably realized that kind of building the brand and the design has been also a very important part of, yeah. of your strategy. Uh, and also as the CMO and co-founder, co-CEO. Like, what, what, what would you say, like, what uh, importance has the brand played in your journey so far? I think it's very important. And uh, actually something that I, I, I'm a bit surprised that a lot of startups actually start with a brand and lay in the bra brand platform very late. Because mm. I think it's so important because the brand is also, it's your culture, right? Mm. So it's about, you know, what can people expect of you, customers and, you know, partners, investors, but it's also internally. What can people, you know, again, going back to expectations. And mm -hmm. when you set up the brand platform, you're, that's the first time where you start to say, okay, articulate, this is our vision, this is our mission, uh, this is our key values, this is where we want to go. Mm. Uh, and that has been so important for us, again, because it makes it easier, I think, especially when you're working with innovation. Because innovation is always hard because it requires so much knowledge, education for people to understand. And mm. I mean, for us, we're working with technology, so you need to understand technology, you need to understand logistics, you need mm. to understand transport. And you need to understand that all of this is going to change, mm. and this is the future. And so it's, it's, you know, it's a massive mm. knowledge needs to go into this to be able to, you know, to connect all of that dots. Mm. And for that, you, you need to have individuals that are open to learn, that are curious, that wants to be part, you know, learning, and also to educate others in how this will work. Mm. And that's a journey in itself, to find those people and to find the talents that, you know, really want, that, that loves it. But mm. when you do, that's, mm. that's really when you create magic. Yeah. And we're speaking a lot about transforming an industry, and there are plenty more industries that needs transforming out there. Um, like specifically for the founders taking on those challenges, like what would be your non-advice to them? <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I? <laughs> uh, actually, I think it was at Slush that I read this, that there's too many bad advice out there. Mm. And I kind of really resonated with me because I, there's so many bad advice. So now I'm going to give you one good advice. <laughs> no, just kidding. So listen carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're always going to have to be accountable for the decisions that you take for your company. And so you could have a bunch of advisors, um, but in the end, you're the one that's going to be accountable. Mm. And I think that, I, I think I learned that the hard way because you have an advisor, like I've been doing this for 20 years and this is how you build a business. And you're like, when you're early on, you're like, you listen to that. Mm. And then you're doing it, you're taking that advice, and then six months later, that person is no longer in the company, mm. and you're there in a bad position because, you know, you went against your own gut feeling. And I think that's what's so important, that that goes back to intuition, that goes back to your core. Mm. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Mm. And people have always told us that we're too ambitious. Mm. And, you know, I got one advice in the beginning, Linnea, you need to choose if you want to focus on, you know, um, transforming uh, for sustainability or equality. You can't do both. Mm. I was like, of course I can't do both. Mm. Like, it, it, there's so much, like, you need to go back to, like, what you truly value, mm. and you need to go back to what you believe in, mm. because that's, that's the fight you're going to go mm. along the way. So trust the gut. Always trust the gut. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe to, to finish off, like, what's, what's next for Enride? I, I, I mean, we're six and a half years in, but I honestly feel like we're just getting started. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very exciting times ahead, I would say. I think that a lot of the challenges that we see moving forward is, is going to be have to be solved with technology. Mm. And we are in a very good position as a technology company to solve some of our time's biggest challenges. Mm. And so I'm very... I'm a bit excited. Uh, of course, the market right now is, comes with a really big responsibility. I do think that we need more leaders. Mm. Uh, we need more leaders that take more responsibility now over the next couple of years. I'm very happy to see a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of the um, investors having more of an impact and climate focus. I think that's exactly what we need, and I think that's also the leadership that we need in the next couple of years. And we need more founders and we need more companies that are going to, to solve these problems. Mm. So. Great. Thank you, Linnea. With those non-words of wisdom, <laughs> non-advice, uh, thank you, and thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you so much. Mm -hmm.